We are delighted to have with us David Miliband this evening, uh, the Chief Executive of the International Rescue Committee, uh, someone I've known for a long time from British politics, but also from working now on the humanitarian front around the world. Uh, in the course of this thinking, what we really want to do is try and wrap our minds around what's happen happening away from home. One of the extraordinary things about this is there's probably ne never been a moment in human history where so many people are experiencing the same thing at the same time in terms of not going to work and being stuck at home. But the risk is that even at this moment, we understand each other and see each other less, particularly those in parts of the world that we generally don't see in the news anyway. And so what I'm hoping is that in the course of this conversation, we'll hear a good deal from David about what the real humanitarian concerns might be, uh, who's holding up and who's not. Um, but before we get into that, and before I start talking uh, to David on that front, I no doubt we'll touch on British politics and the future um, post lockdown too. But before we do that, I just want to make sure that everyone who's joining us and welcome knows a little bit about how this works. I'm sure we're now all so used to Zoom calls, you know exactly how it works. But just to be clear, a thinking is intended to be a forum for civilized disagreement, for organized listening. And key to that is that we hear from you. So if you have something to say, please raise your hand. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a little tab that says participants. If you click on it, there's a list of people's names and a little gray block box that says raise your hand and your digital blue hand will come up. Alternatively, if you want to make a point, do just uh, write in the chat. My colleague uh, uh, and fellow editor Liz Mosley is uh, trying to uh, marshal a great uh, conversation, no doubt, that's going to happen in that chat. Please do. I might well come to you uh, on a point that you make or just use it to inform the conversation that I have uh, with David. Um, we have an hour. Um, I should let you know that we're recording, um, but let's get uh, stuck into it. Uh, David, it's really, it's, it's great to see you. Nice can to see you, you James. Can you, can you help us out at the beginning just by giving us a sense of where you think there really is a, a humanitarian crisis brewing. And I suppose it comes with this caveat, I wonder whether or not the International Rescue Committee is there to worry about this for a living and therefore how you organize it in such a way that you, that you are sure that the ones that you're worrying about are the real threats, not ones that are necessarily potential threats. Thanks, yeah, that's a good and real question because we work in 34 countries that are either at war, so Syria uh, would be a good example, Yemen. Uh, we work in countries that are hosting refugees, so Lebanon and Jordan from Syria, Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia from South Sudan. And we work in the United States, 25 resettlement offices, and in Germany where refugees are being resettled and start a new life. In the 34 war-torn and refugee-affected countries where we work, there are more than enough problems for us not, need, not to need to invent them. But the conditions exist for us to be really fearful about the COVID epidemic, the high density of population. For example, in Bangladesh, where there are a million Rohingya Muslims from Myanmar, the density of population is between four and seven times that of New York. In New York, it's 10,000 people per square kilometer. In the Cox's Bazaar area of Bangladesh, it's between 40,000 and 70,000 per square kilometer. We know Secondly, that the underlying health conditions are very weak. Levels of malnutrition, 18 million people are malnourished under the age of five in the countries that we work in. Um, we also know that the health infrastructure of the countries we work in is, in many cases, abysmal. There are only four ventilators in the whole of South Sudan. I was on the phone to Central African Republic, to our team there this morning. There are only three ventilators in the whole country. So the health infrastructure is very weak. All those reasons give us, all those um, factors make us very fearful. And when we ran the Imperial College data, uh, also World Health Organization data last week, we showed that the on some pretty conservative assumptions about the infection rate, you could expect uh, between 500 million and a billion infections. And if you run an assumption about Chinese levels of healthcare, which is obviously better than many of the places we work, you end up with up to 3 million deaths. And so there's a real um, uh, good reason to fear. Now, I've asked the question, though, that you're asking, which is, where is it? Because yeah. obviously it's not being shown up in the testing. There isn't enough testing going on. Just Central African Republic, which I mentioned where I was speaking to my team this morning, is 85 cases. But 
uh, that's recorded cases. And so the testing can't bring it up. Equally, we know, though, that our health centers are not yet overwhelmed. So your question is a good question. Could it be that the youth of the population is a real factor in mitigating the spread of this disease? Could it be that the disconnection of these 34 countries from the global economy, from Wuhan, uh, is, is helping? Yes, it, it could be. What our health team, which includes some serious epidemi epidemiological um, scientists, say is that we'll know in two weeks' time, but they are very fearful that in two weeks' time you will see the kind of spike that uh, we've come to appreciate in countries like the US or the UK. So yes, we hope for the best, but we have to plan for the worst. And it's not a matter of crying wolf. It's a matter of saying where there is no hand washing, where there is no soap, where there is no fever testing, where there are no isolation centers, you're taking a massive risk with people's lives. And remember, 220 million people in those 34 countries are over the age of 50, so could be in a dangerous group. So I hope that's a, a way of giving you a perspective on what we're trying to do and what kind of situation and risks we're trying to balance. Yeah, I mean, th there was a really interesting piece, David, I think over the weekend in the New York Times, interesting and confusing, to be honest, which was trying to explain why was it in some countries you saw this very high incidence and much lower in other, in other, case, in other countries. I'm just going to, partly as a test to see whether or not everyone was listening when I explained how the uh, technicalities of Zoom work, but partly also just to give a sense of what people's perception is. Can I just ask everyone, to, to answer this question, whether or not they think the developing world is not going to see the same kind of impact from COVID-19 as the developed world. There are, I think, six countries which now have uh, a, a death toll from COVID-19 over 20,000. They're almost all developed economies. Can I ask who here thinks that the developing world is likely to see a, a similar scale of death from the pandemic and its associate uh, impacts um, in the coming three to six months, i.e. there is just a time lag, and who thinks that for the reason, some of the reasons David just mentioned, it won't. So can you put up your hand, go to the little tab, raise your blue hand, if you think that the developing world is just lagging behind and is about to see the scale of fatalities that we've seen in countries like Italy, Spain, the UK, the US and others. Oh, that's cool. So a good, you can see, I mean, everyone can see, I suppose, uh, the same numbers I can see, which is about, you know, 100 and, you know, 180, 190 people out of 600 or so with us. So a good third of people think that it's coming. Um, I'm going to bring in David, if I may. Um, uh, I saw that very early on Paul Clark um, message to ask, to suggest that he wanted to uh, uh, put a point to you. Um, uh, Paul, hello. Um, hello James. How are you? Um, I don't know whether you had an observation or a question or a question wrapped as an observation, whichever one way in. No, it is a question. Um, um, it's not very COVID related though, so David might wish to come to it later, but um, it's, it's because uh, you know, I'm a great, uh, a great admirer of the work, uh, the powerful work you've done, David, about um, as, a, as an advocate for international humanitarian law and refugee law. Um, which obviously have been challenged uh, perhaps in an unprecedented way over the last few years. Um, I wondered if what you, well, whether, and if so, how you felt that climate and uh, climate related crises may affect uh, the way that states address multilateralism in general, um, but IHL in particular. So climate, IHL, by the way, for everyone, is international humanitarian law. Thanks, Paul. It's a, it's a good question. Look, climate, to my mind, is a big driver of displacement. I don't generally use the phrase, quote unquote, climate refugees, because most people who are driven from their homes by a climate change stay within their own home country. So they're climate internal displaced. They don't cross a border into another country. But when it comes to conflict, we know that competition for resources is a big driver of conflict. It's then a, conflict is the biggest driver of displacement. And so you can see how climate change can only add to the refugee numbers. Just to put this in perspective for people, there are 30 million refugees and asylum seekers around the world today. And as of figures published last week, 50 million internally displaced. So in somewhere like Syria, you've got 6 million refugees out of the country, 8 million internally displaced inside. 
the country. And one of the points I make is that the trends driving this displacement, the trends to impunity on the battlefield, which you referred to, trends to the weakness of international political leadership, uh, trends like uh, climate change, they're all long-term, not short-term, which make me think that the refugee crisis and the displacement crisis is a long-term trend, not a short-term blip. And climate undoubtedly contributes to that. I don't think there's a particular, I can't see an immediate link between climate and international humanitarian law per se, but James and I have talked before about what I call the age of impunity. This idea that if you're on the battlefield somewhere, you can get away with murder, and because you can get away with it, you do it, even though you're murdering civilians. And that's what, ha what ha was happened to us with our uh, health workers in Syria. It's happened uh, in Yemen, uh, which is the world's largest humanitarian crisis and where there's been a resumption of fighting over the last week. David, can I, can I tr try and, if you like, bridge both of these things? Um, th there is a sense, we had Tony Blair join us uh, the week before last. He, he, he had just come off the phone with someone from the World Food Programme who was saying to him, look, there's not the infrastructure, in, you were talking about Africa, in order to lock down large parts of the economy. And the bigger risk, according to the head of the WFP, was famine than COVID. And when you look Famine at, than COVID, did you say? Yes, yes. A bigger risk was famine than COVID. And when you look at the countries that you're working in, how much are you worried about the second order effects of this pandemic and, and those causing the, the kind of humanitarian crisis that perhaps we're all concerned about? Hmm. Well, look, we call it this a double emergency. Uh, there's a COVID emergency, which is a health emergency. But there's also an economic, social, educational, domestic violence emergency. The collateral damage of the COVID crisis is very, very grave indeed. We're seeing it in our own work, obviously. And so I think it's right to see this as a double emergency. Um, the relationship between health and the wider economic and social effects may be different in the um, war-torn parts of the world than in the advanced industrialized countries. But I, I, my own view is that the health and the wider um, collateral point in the same direction. And I don't think, if you're hinting towards, well, would it be easier just to say, look, let COVID run rampant, let it take as many people as it does, and then let the economy re recover quicker. I, I don't see that that is a very viable strategy, not least because the people that we're talking about are mixed in with the general population and the general population suffers in many of these countries severe ill health as well. That may not be the case in Lebanon and Jordan, which have, relatively speaking, middle-class health systems for the domestic population. But when you come to the Nigerias of this world, when you think about the Ugandas of this world, when you think about the Kenyas, the Ethiopias, the Bangladeshis, the Pakistans of this world, those are countries where the underlying health conditions are quite grave and are quite compromised. And so I think it's really important to have in mind the double emergency. My own view is that the prevention agenda is being disgracefully neglected over the last two months. We've heard a lot about denialism in, in Western countries mm. uh, about their own situation. There's been a denialism over the last two months that anything can be done in the kind of places where we work. So um, the, the multilateral donors seem frozen in the headlights as we're saying, look, for the want of a water washing station with soap, the disease take, takes root for the want of testing the people who've got it don't get separated from those who haven't. For the want of an isolation center, whole communities, never mind whole families, uh, get it. And that seems to me to be, uh, on the one hand, a real neglect. On the other hand, the economic and social damage is more immediate because there's absolutely no safety net. And so you see the impact, the wider collateral damage, perhaps more quickly, but I think the two point in the same direction rather than opposing each other. And, and David, on that, um, I just messaged Edie Lush because she was asking about the positive impacts, and I'm going to come to Edie in a minute. But on that, you, you've raised a subject that's come up quite a lot for us in the last few weeks. This, sort, this sense that the international community is not acting in any cohesive or effective way. Is, is that your experience of it? And if so, is there anything that can practically... Well, James, be it's not a sense. It's a fact. Yeah. I mean, it's not a sense that the G7 couldn't agree a statement among the seven of them. It's not a sense that the G20 have only had one meeting. It's not a sense that the UN Security Council has not been able to pass its resolution on this. It's a reality. So um, the reality is that what Ian Bremer calls a leaderless world, a G0 world, 
uh, welcome to welcome to 2020 and the and the response to the COVID crisis. So You've what do you got, do about that, David? So what do you do about that? Well, I think that you have to um, make the case first of all that the lesson of COVID is that it's a disease of the connected world, which needs more international action, not less. So you so when President Trump says we've got to cut the funding for the WHO. You've got to say World Health Organization. You've got to say, no, that's the opposite. The World Health Organization made mistakes. But the last thing we need is a weaker World Health Organization. We need a stronger World Health Organization. Yeah. Secondly, you need to, to make the case there will be no return to quote unquote normality or there will be no normality in the industrialized world if it remains the case that beyond its own borders, it doesn't know what's happening and can't afford to let its citizens travel anywhere without going back into quarantine for two weeks. And so there's, as you, you, you'll, I don't know if you've interviewed him, but there's this Israeli uh, author, uh, Yuval Harari, he's written these uh, incredible books. And he said, um, the nationalist vision of the future is what he calls, quote unquote, a network of fortresses. Yeah. And it's a sort of medieval um, notion. Actually, Henry Kissinger said there's no, there's, you, you shouldn't think about the future as a return to the walled city. We've got to get it into our heads that leave aside the notion of return, a new normality cannot be prosperous and inspiring if it's a normality that's within the confines of simply our own national boundaries, because we're not going to be able to take advantages never, of the modern world, never mind attack its problems if we and do And David, so. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. So, so I, I, I'm one of those people, possibly naive, who thinks that you're in a position to do something about this, that that if you think that the G7 is not working, the G20 is not working, the UN and its agencies aren't working, then there's a moment to try and bring together a different kind of coalition or institution to act at that level. Is that just naive? Well, just from a, first of all, um, you threw in there the UN and its institutions with the uh, failure of political leadership. And I think it's important to, to, to point out that within the constraints of its limited mandates, within the constraints of its funding crisis that's been precipitated, various UN institutions are doing extraordinary work. They, they, make, they make mistakes, but that, we all make mistakes. Um, so just, just but be careful. But they're not, but they're not, that's, that's true. I can understand that. And I know on the ground, UN people work incredibly hard, but they are not convening a global response to this. Yeah. So and the UN is only as strong as its member states. Yeah. No, the UN is only as strong as its member states. And your question, what do you do in a G0 world? What do you do in a leaderless world? It's a, it's, it's a, here, here's my answer. And I um, you know, don't claim it. You can judge whether it's convincing or not. Um, my, my view is that big political change only ever happens when three things come together. Government leadership, business and NGO innovation, and mass mobilization. And my point is, they don't have to come in that order. Sometimes the business and NGO innovation can come first, and then the mass mobilization follows, and then the governments come in behind it. And I, I am leading a life now where I'm focused on uh, having uh, on an organization, obviously with less power than a government, but facing fewer obstacles to getting something done than a government. And so there's an entrepreneurialism that says, we'll forge the, the, the I was on a, a call with a, with a pharmaceutical company this morning, we'll do something with them, at a time when the governments are not funding us. We will do our research and development with tech companies at a time when the governments are risk averse about that. Um, we will we'll try and incubate a uh, ways of working in the future, not just in health, but in other areas that fix the holes in the global safety net, not in a way that's anti-government, because in the end we'll need the government. But if the governments aren't doing it, we have to try and show what kind of future that can be. And so for example, just to give you a slightly, I hope this, does, this, this, this helps. One of the um, poorest parts of international aid spending is on early childhood development, which mm. we both know is the most impactful in value for money terms. Um, so who gave the largest early childhood development grant in, a humanitarian sec in the humanitarian setting? At the MacArthur Foundation, we with Sesame Workshop won $100 million to pilot a gold standard in um, social and emotional learning for refugee war-torn kids in the war-torn Middle East. And we're going to help one and a half million kids in person, seven million kids uh, online. And we're doing that not because it substitutes for government, but it shows governments the way. And then hopefully they will come in behind it. So my theory of the case at the moment is, you could say forced into this, but that's for another time, um, <laughs> the, um, uh, the, that We've got to make the most of the entrepreneurialism of NGOs and the, um, and the private sector and show the way, the charitable sector as well, foundations, 
but we've got to then recognize to do it at scale, you need the multilateral system to come in behind it. So I'm, David, I'm gonna come back to that because there are a number of people I saw, Finley, Melissa, a bunch of other people saying, I think touching on the mass mobilization point, you know, how do you individually actually help make a difference? But uh, I said a, a while ago, I'd come to Edie because actually Edie was making the point that she had heard stories about real change happening. Hello, Edie, how are you? Hello, good, yeah. It's very nice of you to have these during, um, while I'm making dinner, it provides um, much more interest than chopping my scallions at the moment. So um, I was interviewing somebody last week for my podcast, a woman in Kenya who, She's a frontline health worker. And one of the things she said, which was fascinating, was that she's noticed as a result of more forced hand washing uh, in the urban informal settlements, so the slums, she's actually noticed, and a result of the fact that now more taps are being put in um, for people to wash their hands, they're actually seeing huge reduction in some areas of diarrhea. So in fact, a positive. Um, and I was also looking um, at something that the W, the World Food Program had said is that they're actually using, um, they're extending and rapidly extending their blockchain technology within the Cox's Bazaar um, settlement that you mentioned before so that more people could go and um, then just the, the holder of of the card could go and, and receive aid. So I wonder, as we all know, that positive stories um, are what make people pay attention to positive change. I wonder if there was any other positive stories that you've heard um, as a result of COVID-19. So the kind of silver lining, but from a refugee development standpoint. Well, look, it's a great point. And necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, that, that's the, the truth. So we're using radio now for um, remote education. We are um, using motorbike riders to go and do child protection uh, work. We're using social media to take on fake news, which just in parentheses is a huge problem in the places that we uh, work. Uh, we are um, trying to, we're, we're running our finance department without, having, without anyone having to go into an office in New York. So there's all sorts of um, innovation that is coming out of this, uh, forced innovation, which is a good thing. And um, my friend Peter Hyman has started a website uh, about education in uh, advanced countries called uh, Learning from Lockdown. And our mindset is all about learning from lockdown. We've got to do the prevention. We've got to do the health response. We've got to deal with the immediate collateral damage, which frankly is appalling in, in terms of um, violence against women and girls, which is a massive thing. In the place we work we've got to adapt our programs like with the radio example i gave you and then fifthly we've got to learn the right lessons and the lesson is that when you have such huge holes in domestic and global safety nets you're courting disaster and I tell you living in the us you see what having holes in the in the safety net I mean undocumented workers don't dare go to uh, the hospital in case they get have to give their name and address and get registered and handed over to the immigration authorities and that fuels a a really dangerous cycle in the global system. Three billion people have no access to hand washing in their own home. And so um, that lesson learning, I think, has to draw from the real examples of the, of the kind that you're, that you're giving. I mean, the examples I've given us are not quite silver linings in the same sort of way, but if the world wakes up and says now, well, look, three billion people not having hand washing in their own home is something that is a threat to life and livelihood everywhere, and we've got to sort it out, that will be a serious silver lining. David, can we, can we talk, Edie, thank you so much, but can, can we also just focus a bit on this mass mobilization point you made? Um, I should say, there are a number of people who've flagged the, the, the issue that you just raised, which is about social media and misinformation, Roe Yacobi, I was just seeing making that point. But the thing that people are really weighing in on is this point about mass mobilization. How do you participate? And, and I think it was uh, Melissa, I don't know whether I can come to you and hear whether or not you have a view on how it's possible to weigh in. Hello there. Do you, do you, do you want to make a point, Melissa, just about how you can effectively be part of a mass mobilization? Is that clear to you? Um, no. <laughs> no but no. I just think now, you know, is a time when a lot of us are feeling perhaps like we don't have a motive um be that because people are on furlough or for many other reasons but as someone who's a university student who would love to be able to help in whatever way you can at these points that we feel like this is really a point of change and whether we make it a good point or a bad point 
Um, and I think, you know, obviously Dave is in a, and lots of people are in very fortunate positions that they actually have a say on these things. Um, but what can we do to help make things be better at the end of this and not worse? David? Um, I mean, I think if I had a really good answer to that, then, uh, you know, I'd maybe be doing something else. But the, uh, <laughs> because it's a very, it's a very good point. I, I, I think in the following ways, Melissa. First, using your voice. I mean, there are more ways to use your voice than ever before. And I do think that raising your voice is, is I, I profoundly believe in the power of uh, people's voices to make a difference. And uh, I think there are more mechanisms for that voice to be heard through the din um, than before. Secondly, I think it's to pool ideas. Um, I, we are, I, I don't claim we're yet great at this, but um, I think that the way in which um, the connected world allows people from, it, from all across the world to contribute to problem solving is a really powerful uh, tool. And we've used human-centered design in our uh, R&D lab, it's called the Airbell lab, where we focus on the needs of the client, but then we can bring people from around the world to try and help solve those needs. So if you're a woman with five kids in South Sudan who can't get to the health center, how can we train community health workers so that they bring the service to you? And we've helped develop some of those ideas with the ideas, I, uh, I don't know what your degree is in, but or what you're studying, but uh, I would say join your ideas. Number one, raise your voice. Number two, join your ideas. Um, uh, thirdly, I, I, I think that um, the, the, the other aspect is that in the end, this has to take political form. And that political form, as you said in your question, it, it, it's got some pretty dystopian elements because one version of this crisis is that it's the product of too much internationalism, too much connection, too many foreigners, um, and it leads you in a pretty, as I say, dystopian way. There's an alternative political argument, which is that it's the product of not too strong international institutions, but too weak, that it's the product of too weak a safety net, too, too, too many holes in the safety net. And uh, that, that's a different end of the political argument. And I'm seeing in the US people very frozen out of politics at national level, but quite engaged at local level. And maybe that's where the seeds of some of this political renewal will come from. David, I'd like to, Melissa, thank you. Thanks so much. I mean, I'm actually going to go there in this chat. I don't know whether you saw while David was speaking, Melissa, someone called George Maxwell invited you to join Corona Unity, um, we, which given I don't know what Corona Unity is, I thought I'd better find out from him uh, what he's working on. Hello there. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, first of all, I want to say a massive thank you. And it's incredible that I'm managing to speak to David Miliband from Paris. Um, but no, so Corona UT is essentially, um, I actually found out about it over LinkedIn, but it was started by students and we're trying to be the centre of everything, of everything Corona. So that, that's, uh, I head up the Charities and Ventures division um, and it puts together ideas about charities, what they're doing in the community, um, volunteers who want to help. And also we have a phone a friend service um, that people, first of all, who are suffering from loneliness um but also people who are looking to, to help like melissa um it's just a, it's a really good way to to be productive during confinement and it's got as i said it's student-led um and i think students have not had the best uh portrayal during this crisis george thank you thank you so much i'm gonna i'm gonna go before i just go back to david actually i'm gonna pick up on, on that on the idea of mass mobilization because i'm actually ask ronan dunn who's here, who, who knows a thing or two about organization and masses, because Ronan runs Verizon in the States. So R Ronan, when you think about this and you think about how you use technology and mobile networks in this time, what, what, what do you think can be done that fits in with, I think David's point, particularly around business innovation and m mass mobilization? Well, uh, first thing to say is, and David, thank you for taking time with us today, is uh, we've just um, added to our volunteering platform a virtual volunteering program, which is allowing people to do practical things in their local community during lockdown so that they have a sense of, of making uh, an impact. But one of my concerns in all of this is that the immediate response of businesses will be to reconfigure supply chains, look at some of the geopolitical risks associated with post-COVID, 
and as a result actually amplify some of the negative impacts on a lot of the communities, David, that you are looking to support on a, on a day-to-day basis. If I think about the re-engineering of supply chains in textiles, the fashion industry and others, there may well be an even bigger economic uh, impact on populations, I think of Bangladesh, I think of places like that, where their economies could be devastated in the post-COVID response. And certainly the politics in the US will encourage a lot of us to try and move jobs back on shore, move more of our supply chains and manufacturing back into the, to the US. So uh, I think we just have to recognize that um, we have a global citizenship responsibility as we look to reconfigure our businesses to respond to the practical realities We've moved 95,000 people from being in the front line in offices and stores to working from home in three and a half weeks. We have moved 5,000 in the previous 18 months. So we're absolutely having to flex and that's where technology will help. But I'm also concerned about those areas where uh, the technology may result in a greater digital divide and a greater impact on the economies of lesser developed uh, economies because we move because of geopolitics and global supply chain. And I wonder whether, David, in thinking about where we as both corporates and as nation states are thinking about where our support is needed, is there a danger that we'll shift everything to COVID and leave a lot of people unsupported? David? Yeah, it's a really powerful and I think correct point that you can put it in a very neutral and sort of common sense way, there's going to be a lot of pressure to shorten supply chains to make sure that resilience is increased or to, to argue on the argument that resilience is increased. You can imagine supply chains of friends, um, friends in the sense of friendly nations uh, and, and supply chains closer to home. And that's certainly going to be a big part of the Western uh, narrative, I think, in politics, Western argument. But here's kind of an interesting point. Um, we're going to find, as uh, people who are used to living in liberal democracies, that the countries that move in when our companies move out or when we withdraw our aid, the Chinese are not going into retreat. I mean, they are making friends and in some cases making threats in many places. And so the political geography of the modern world, I think, is going to change very significantly with the if there is the kind of retreat or withdrawal uh, that uh, you were referring to. So the economic geography and the political geography go together. And I, if you permit me, James, I just want to make this point. Um, 2019 was the first year in more than 100 years when the autocracies of the world accounted for a greater share of global income than the liberal democracies. So this economic and political shift isn't just happening in a vacuum. It's happening at a time of what political scientists call democratic recession. 113 countries have had reductions in political freedom over the last 15 years. And so this shock is playing into a very inclement climate, not just in terms of the global, the weakness of the global safety net, but also the retreat of some core values. And so when we're making an argument about the future of the global system, we're making an argument that isn't just a technocratic argument, it's a very deep political argument as well. And well, David, could, could we talk about that? Because I said at the start uh, that we'd want to talk about what was happening on the humanitarian front, but also then turn a little and think about politics in the future. Can I just finish just on the humanitarian front, James, just to say, I mean, people should know that the, um, uh, the sense of um, national leaderships being frozen in the headlights when it comes to the global system is absolutely overwhelming if you're trying to run an NGO and get, uh, and, and get action out there. The, the, the sense that um, there is a, a, a lack of mobilization, so out of, uh, there's, there's mobilization so out of kilter with the governmental mobilization, so out of kilter with the needs, I, I wouldn't want that to be lost. I'm not gonna spend the next 20 minutes going on about that, but I really would say, I didn't want to say this to Melissa because it seemed, um, it seemed unfair, but if there are people on here who are able to make financial contributions, I tell you, at the moment, the governments are not making the financial contributions. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that. At the moment, we have one um, cost, exten cost extension in South Sudan, one EU grant in um, Uganda. That's the only new money we've had from any government anywhere since this crisis started. 
Goodness. And, 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 you know, I go back to the point that you made right at the top, that we may be two weeks away from seeing something that, yeah. that, 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 dwarf, that dwarfs what we've seen already. But, 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 David, the reason I want to just, if you, if you don't mind, sort of focus on the politics, is that I think that this is, in many ways, energising people to think differently about politics, but also rattling some of their core beliefs. And you made the point about autocracy versus democracy, is it not the case that when you look at the world today, the autocrats are handling COVID better than the Democrats and that the free markets and free societies are really struggling in a way that control economies aren't? Well, it's shocking to me that you would say that, James. I mean, I hope you, I, you could, for you to say, someone as learned and well-read, you'd say that aren't the autocracies handling it better when you look at what's happened in Iran, for example, how, how can you say that? When you look at, when you, if, you, if you want to compare Iran to South Korea, there's no comparison. What is the case is that after its month, two months of squashing the story, China has responded very well. And America, which is the leader of the free world in many ways, has um, handled it in a really um, confused and confusing way. But look at South Korea, look at Germany, look at Ireland, for example, you can't say that a free society, that the free societies haven't handled it well. And so I think you've really got, the, the, if, the, if this narrative has eaten its way into your frame of thinking, then we've really got a problem. The truth is some free societies have handled it very badly and some have handled it pretty well. And, okay. and you could say the same for, for the other way around. I just want to make one interesting point about Singapore, which I read about uh, last week. Singapore, which handled it seemingly better than anyone else, has gone from 300 um, infections to 12,000 because the migrants in Singapore who are living in 20 to 30 people to a building, um, it's run rife there. So um, be careful, the, the assumptions of that. There will be an argument put by the Chinese leadership that their one party system explains why they have handled it quote unquote better. But that is not a fact, that is an assertion. Uh, but but I, but I think, David, I think it's a really important assertion. And I think the people who believe in democracy, and the reason I put it to you, the people who believe in democracy are, are actually going to have to make the case and make the case for dealing also with the failures of some of the, some of the biggest democracies. And, yes. you know, the reason yes. that I put that to you, and I put it to you because I think it's got a currency that it just didn't even have five, ten yes. years ago. It does. Well, it does, but it, frankly, it did in December as well as in uh, March. So it is an accelerant or a rocket booster in the wrong hands under an argument that was taking shape. When, and when I said 113 countries have suffered democratic recession, why did, um, President, why did President Putin feel able to say last July in your old paper, The Financial Times, the liberal idea is obsolete? Well, he's, he's, he, thinks, he, he thinks that he's on the, on, on the way up. Now, he, yeah. I think he'd probably say something different given his problems with the oil price and his problems with COVID. But uh, you're right. There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a, something deep there that's being played into and the soft power of the US is going down and the soft power of the Chinese is on the way up. So, so David, we, before we get into a, a long digital arm wrestle over the failures of liberal democracy, I just wanted to remind people, please do stick your digital hands up uh, uh, if you want to weigh in. C can we zero in a little on how much you think politics is going to change now? And, you know, we, we are both children of the age of globalisation, which has in so many ways been, be, been good to us, you know, in terms of lives and experience. M many people wouldn't agree. Many people will look at the pandemic and say this is a slam dunk argument against globalization and the trading uh, and the free trades capacity to export ills as well as goods. This is a time for us to, as you say, put up our borders and just be much more careful about the way the global system works. Well, I think they will say that, or some people will say that, but why would, I don't see why the fact that passengers were going from Wuhan to New York is an argument against is an argument about trade. That's an argument about the movement of people. And presumably, the argument shouldn't be or won't be that no one should be able to fly from Wuhan to New York. I mean, that goes back to this network of fortresses argument. So I think you're, yeah, I think you're right. But I, I think we we have to ask ourselves what's true. My, my story is that um, globalization has been too 
insecure, unequal, and unsustainable for its own good. Mm. And the answer is to have a different global social and economic compact, not to say that we're better off with somehow less global. I mean, I don't believe that standards of living of the poorest in Britain or America would be higher if there was um, somehow a, a less connected world. I mean, the, the reason inequality has risen in the last 10 years in Britain and in the States is, or even 40 years, is domestic policy choices, not international, not somehow international uh, um, fait accompli. And I do think that you can ask very hard questions about the, the, the basis of global trade, what are the labor standards, the environmental standards, the fairness standards that underpin it. Um, you, but but it, the, most of the inequality that we suffer from today is domestically generated, not internationally generated. So can, we, can we talk about then that domestic inequality, right? Because I think one of the extraordinary things that's happened in the UK, but in many other places, has been the arrival of a form of universal basic income. The government has stepped in and said, if the firms can't keep you employed, they will set up what's called a furloughing scheme, a system which supports 80% of wages. You know, this is a conservative government that is doing something that is close to salary support for, what well, is salary support for now 4 million people. Do, do you think that the center of gravity moves in politics as a result of this? Do you think that ideas like universal basic income suddenly has, a, has its moment? Uh, and what do you think will be the economics or the, the, the politics of the economy uh, as we come out of this lockdown? Well, yes, I do think the center of gravity moves to the left. I think it moves to the left on economics, but I thought that um, throughout the years of austerity. I mean, contrary to what Jeremy Corbyn said, um, he, he didn't bring in anti-austerity into the Labour Party. No Labour government and no Labour opposition in my living memory has ever been an austerity uh, party. But over the last uh, 10 years, in the austerity years, there's no question that in the UK, to my mind, the centre of gravity on issues of market and state has moved to the quote-unquote left, the centre of gravity on issues of tax, the centre of gravity on the, on the role of the state. The tragedy for the Labour Party is it didn't have a leadership that was able to uh, be credible in doing something about it. Now, I think that there's a similar thing going on in the US where in a way, President Trump's election, um, he ran in a way that, 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 that ran to the left of some traditional Republicans on economic issues. And um, here's, the, here's the rub though. I think it moves to the left. And, and I, don't, I think that um, given that we've had 10 years in which banks have played a completely different, central banks have played a completely different role than anyone could ever have conceived. I mean, uh, um, monetary easing has been something that would have been considered anathema 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so the orthodoxies are, are out, I think, on, on economics. But here's the thing. If every European country is having 20, 30, 40% um, of GDP added to its debt to GDP ratio, the laws of economics don't disappear. I mean, we know from, I think the Italian G debt to GDP ratio before this crisis hit was 137 or 140%. And that imposes real constraints on the government. There'll be a flush of um, movement to the left. There'll be a, there'll be a sense that the, the old orthodoxies are out, that all sorts of things are on the agenda, that a, an activist state is needed for the modern world. I agree with all that. But there's also going to be a reckoning, which is that 130% um, of GDP puts different constraints on governments than 60% or 80% of yeah. GDP, never mind 280%, which I think is the Japanese uh, level. Now, people can say in return, yeah, but during the Second World War in the 19th century, states had debt to GDP ratio of 100, 200%, and the earth didn't come to an end. That's true. But my point is that there, are, there will be a move to the left, but the constraints don't disappear. They will reappear. And they may reappear for, you know, they may reappear in, if there isn't proper mutualized European support for its weaker economy, it will appear on the European continent in the Eurozone, um, and it could appear elsewhere as well. It's, it's interesting, there's an article in the, you mentioned in the New York Times, there's a big article in the um, New York Times today by the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, all about debt write-off for poor countries, saying watch out. Uh, watch out in that? Watch out for what's going to happen if you don't, he, he was saying debt holidays aren't enough. Oh, if we allow the, if, if we load onto the poorest countries in the world, another 30, 40, 50, 100% of debt to GDP, 
um, it, it, th then there's a, that, that's a terrifying cocktail. There, there, there are, David, a, a number of people who are, who, who are trying to think through what the implications are going to be in terms of this new domestic politics and what happens internationally. And so in the, in the last 10 minutes, I'd love to circle back onto that and try and think through whether or not you think that there's going to be less appetite for trying to address aid development funding in this, in this world, or whether this is a sort of temporary kind of crisis of self-involvement and you think that there is something stronger that comes from it. Well, here's, I think it's a very, very interesting question. And, and to state the obvious, I don't know the answer. Uh, but um, here's my, my central case at the moment. I feel reasonably confident that we, I don't know who we is in this case, but I, I would feel confident in saying that global, the global health agenda has got a better than evens chance of making real progress in the next 10 years as a result of this crisis. You know, the World right. Health Organization launched a campaign for, world, for universal health coverage from UHC last year. I bet no one, you know, half the people on the call, three quarters of people on the call haven't heard of it. I think there's a real chance that the, the, the obvious lesson of this crisis that global health matters to local health, I think we can win that argument. I'm much more worried about the arguments around global education, global security, global ceasefires, global diplomacy, um, global trade. I'm, I'm more worried about that. That would be my, my answer to you. Did you hear that? Uh, and what? You... Yes, I did. I did. Um, I hope I'm not. Uh, I thought you might have. Oh, can you hear me, David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. D David, uh, and what about? The, the, there's been also a bunch of questions about climate and growth, and and I wondered whether I could ask you to sort of tackle some of the big questions that I think people are reflecting on lockdown in their homes, which is: is this a feasible fork in the road? in which people say, you know what, we knew we had a climate crisis, we knew we had an, uh, an economy that wasn't working for the people, this is the moment where we're going to redirect, reset ourselves, or are you with the view that actually the economy is going to be in such bad shape that when actually people do get out of their homes, they're going to be saying, let's just get back to work, let's get jobs and get back to work? Well, I think they will be saying get back to work, but I don't know if the jobs are going to be there for them. Um, I mean, I, I think if you're... If you think about the service economy, Britain is an 85% service economy. I mean, I wonder how many of those parts of the service economy are going to be there now. And, and given that uh, everyone will be poorer at the end of this, I, I, I'm not sure the job. I, I don't. I, I think the uh, you know the, the forecast on the jobs front is is very is for a slow recovery. I don't buy this argument about the V-shaped recovery. I'm much more worried about a, a sort of L shape with a little bouncing. I, I think that. I don't see a quick bounce back. And so I think there is a, ch a chance of a, of a new reckoning. I think that you'd have to say about, if you ask me the same question about environment as you asked me about aid, I'd say I think it's more likely that the S in ESG, environmental, social, governmental, the, 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 you can imagine the social um, yeah. coming up and the environmental being neglected. Now, of course, they're related. Um, but obviously, it's a concern. You see people writing these, you, you say, aha, we were told that climate was such a big problem. You see, it's not such a big problem, which is obviously a stupid thing to say. But that's um, uh, an argument that's, that's put out there. I, I, would be, I am worried about that. Because the truth is, Britain was due to hold the absolutely critical conference of parties of the UN to the Climate Convention in uh, November in Glasgow. And we were nowhere nowhere in the preparation a year before the paris summit that actually did the big deal five years ago president obama and um president xi agreed on american chinese uh, emissions reductions no such thing has happened so i mean i was really worried even before this crisis struck i was in the munich security conference in uh, february saying where are the british ministers saying all of our chips are on the climate uh, effort for the november conference i'm worried that this uh, crisis is going to be health, global health at the expense of global environment. I think that's a real concern. I don't have a, a good answer or a reassuring answer on that. I don't think it's so much a matter of people saying, okay, let's go and party now. I think it's more that there's just a bandwidth issue about how much yes. can be addressed. That's, that's, re that's really interesting. There, there are a number of people who are making I mean, absolutely fascinating points. Laura Thompson has made this really fascinating point about fairness in the age of the vaccine, as and when a vaccine or therapy emerges, 
how do you ensure the fair distribution of it? I don't know whether Laura is able to um, she make the point much better than me, but but looking forward, David, there's there's a there's a global politics too to the sort of post twenty twenty world. Uh, who's thinking about that? Who's trying to ensure some kind of equity in that? Well, and, and uh, we are. So, I mean, I hope people will visit the um, uh, International Rescue Mission website, rescue.org, and they'll see that our sort of master narrative about this crisis has got all sorts of stuff that we need to do now, but also makes the point, we, the vaccine distribution, we are the last 10 miles for the vaccine for people who otherwise not get it. Now, to be fair, it's not just us. There's a, actually a conference today that the EU, with UK support, um, it's still sticks in the gullet when you have to say EU plus the UK, but we're not going That's down another that. That's another thing, so, David, we're not doing we're, that. We're not going to go down that. Yeah. We're not going there. But, but I, I said it with a straight face. Yeah. EU, with UK support, um, is having a, a global conference today about um, equity and vaccine distribution, which is great. I just want to put in a little coda, though. I mean, there's billions and billions and billions being thrown towards the vaccine, which is great. That's the sexy end of the market. You've got 150 different pharmaceutical companies running their own um, and, and, and universities running their own trials. But the people who we're trying to help, it's going to be three, five, seven, even a decade before we get to them, not we, before the, the world gets to them. And so the answer is that the distribution channels have got to uh, address the, the moral calculus of whether you help those who are richest, those who are nearest the, uh, of the nation that do, develops the um, vaccine. I don't like either of those. Um, but what basis are you going to do it? Because producing seven and a half billion vaccines is not a joke, especially if you have to do two of them for each, for, for each uh, person. David, on that, can I just, can I just bring in, there, there are a couple of people, uh, Mark Prussian has made an interesting point about tax, but also an interesting point about vaccine trials, and Alistair Burt too, I'd like to bring in, who makes a point about fairness in manufacture. I don't know whether, Mark, you're able um, to weigh in. Yes, yes I you? can. Greetings. Hello, everyone. Thank you for asking me. So in the United States, we're doing vaccine, while well, we're getting ready, to do vaccine trials, hopefully when science advances, and it's all for profit and it will be the wealthiest win first. Sadly, it's not what I want, it's not what I'd like our company to do, but it's the system of for profit healthcare that we have in the US. And, and so, and Mark, what does that mean practically speaking? It means that. So we bid for pharmaceutical companies, the giants that are based in Ireland, like Allergan and so forth, and others. We bid for them to submit contracts. We submit contracts and we bid for them to send us science and patients and we test the vaccines. Right now we're testing treatments on real patients. Okay, sending well, it back to the research labs. Okay, well, I, th that itself seems like something worth kind of exploring and exa examining. Mark, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move swiftly because I'm gonna, there's only about five minutes left, but Alistair Burke, you were making a point about vaccine manufacture as opposed to distribution. Hello, Alistair. Um, hi, and uh, hello, David, good to see you. Uh, yeah, hi, I want to make two points. I mean, once the vaccine has been discovered, it need not only be made in the country uh, of the origin of the, uh, of the uh, ability to, 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 man to manufacture it. Uh, you can spread uh, intellectual property and you've got to make sure you manufacture way beyond the United Kingdom, the United States, or France, or, or whatever. And there are plenty of people who can manufacture all over the world. The second point is, we're gonna face this again. This is not the only crisis we're going to have where a vaccine <coughs> uh, will be needed. The way pathogens move and are created, we will face this again, and the mortality ratios might be higher. So we've got to develop a system where we don't have this scrabbling for vaccines that's going on now to be able to cope with the next one and this is a good opportunity when we're dealing with this to think through how we deal with it in the future but i would say as well as discovering the vaccine the question has got to be where is it going to be manufactured and people have got to be prepared to share the intellectual property and those who've created that have got to be compensated for that but it's got to be a worldwide collective uh, ability to do that uh, Alistair, thank you very much. Um, for those of you, I'm not sure everyone will know, but Alistair Burt served as a Foreign Office Minister until not so recently, so we'll understand the, the issue that you raised right at the beginning, David, which is to what extent do you actually create these, these some kind of multilateral organisations and systems that deal with these problems 
with, with not a view on 2020, but a view on the 21st century. And if you remember for AIDS, that was what was done. So there is precedent on this. It's not, it, 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 it can be done. And actually, I think that at the conference I referred to that's been called today, I think President Macron was talking about this. He's thinking globally. To be fair to him, he's really trying to think globally. And, and just, we've got a couple of minutes left, David. So what I would really love to know is, go back to your initial point, sitting where you are, looking at, you know, what you described as a, a potential threat that will be overwhelming within just a, that you may see within a couple of weeks and this double emergency the, the covid emergency and all its associated risks playing out in parts of the developing world and the you know as you made quite forcefully the point the failure of any international leadership what is the step that that in the position you're in now you can make is it that you pick up the phone to the Gates Foundations of the world and say, you must be the conveners of this kind of effort, or you pick up the phone to the Saudis as the conveners of the G20 and say, you must be the answers, or the UN agencies. What, what's the answer to Alistair's point about building something that is long-term and resilient and international? Yeah, I don't have a good answer at the moment. I mean, what am I doing today? I'm speaking to our team in the Central African Republic. i am uh, got a couple, I've talked to a pharmaceutical company I've got a couple of fundraising calls. I'm doing this with you. I'm working on our uh, strategy and I'm focused also on, and, and this is the closest part of the answer to your, um, to your question. I'm focused on uh, Thursday, the United Nations is publishing their new global humanitarian response plan. The last one was for $2 billion, which as Mark Lowcock, the undersecretary for humanitarian affairs said on in the Guardian today, the real need is $19 million, um, not, at um, $90 billion, not, uh, not $2 billion. So uh, their original um, design was really poor on that score. Secondly, the original design said only $100 million of the $2 billion for frontline workers who are actually the NGO workers. So I'm, I'm focused on the next UN appeal being much larger. Uh, I'm focused on it um, having a minimum 30% threshold for frontline uh, workers. I'm then focused on the on the US, which has historically been the largest donor to these uh, international appeals. The US Congress, I think there's a decent chance we can get a $12 billion out of them uh, towards the 90 billion. And so uh, 12 billion, by the way, the 90 billion is all developing countries, not just the humanitarian account. And the, and the 12 billion would be uh, a subgroup of the, of the 90. That's how you get the 30 to 37 uh, percent. So that's my focus, that we've got to get a, um, a standard around which we can rally. And our best hope at the moment is the UN appeal. At the same time, I'm desperately trying to fulfill the organizational priorities that we've set. One, keep our staff safe. We don't have a staff debt yet, um, touch wood. Uh, secondly, um, uh, frontline response, gearing up our um, health facility. I was incredibly proud to learn from our Bangladesh team. They first ordered PPE kit on the 8th of February because our emergency systems were kicking into uh, gear. And thirdly, uh, the response of our programs to the second half of the emergency. How do we keep delivering education in a COVID-proofed way? Now, you can come back to me and I would plead guilty to this. Does that provide the kind of global answer that you're um, referring to? I'm afraid it doesn't because I've got a responsibility to 30,000 staff and uh, to an, an $800 million organization. And so that, in a way, you could say, well, that reflects the gap that exists. But in the end, we've got to, I think, our theory of the case is showing what can be done and then getting the governments to come in behind it is the right way of doing it. Just lobbying on its own isn't going to work. All right. Well, well David, on, on that note, showing what can be done, um, let, let, let me do what you can't, which is actually to make a plug for the International Rescue Committee. I know everyone on this call actually, you know, it, it cares about the work that you and your colleagues do. So firstly, given everything else that you're doing today, thank you for your time. If you've been to a thinking before, you'll know that the aim of it is really to try and drive our journalism. And, and the thing that has been brilliant, of course, listening to you, David, is it has had that mix of, you know, really uh, pointed observations about what's happening today, but big ideas about the way the world is changing. I'm really struck that we will, certainly in our daily sensemaker e email, keep an eye out for this potential humanitarian crisis and the double emergency you talked about. Good. I do think that the, you know, your, your recipe for political change 
you know, in government, in, in business and NGO, innovation and mass mobilization actually is, is quite energizing for people. It gives you a sense of what you can do. Uh, I think the two or possibly three chilling ideas that you mentioned were a world of a network of fortresses, right? That seems to me to be a very plausible prospect, uh, particularly on the back, as you described, of a world in which autocracies were overtaking democracies in their economic might. And finally, this bandwidth point that at a time when people think we're going to have a better understanding of the need and the capacity to deal with climate change, actually, we don't have the attention to look beyond the health agenda. That said, the one thing that is helpful is to know that you put real thought and, and real um, uh, energy behind what the UN is doing and believe that that is an important step. It's something that journalistically we again will make sure that we look into. But on behalf of us, all of us at Tortoise, all of our members, you know, everyone who's attended this evening, um, a big and a heartfelt thank you to you, David. I know there's a lot of pressure on your time. Normally, if you were in our newsroom, we would sort of applaud you and take you for a drink. No, 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 no. Uh, we could do neither of those things, but we can give you a cheerful wave goodbye. No, so thank uh, you. Please, Thanks very um, much, James. It was great to do it. I really enjoyed it and look forward to doing it again. Thank, thank you very much, David. Thank yeah, you thanks. very much. Take care.